Yes. Wait, the clock's already rolling. Oh, it's already rolling? Oh, whoa, on, whoa. Hey, we are not in sync. Oh my god. Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, Kelsey and I uh, run a nonprofit called the Video Game History Foundation, uh, as you all know, because that's literally what's on the screen right now. Um, we are a nonprofit dedicated to making sure that the story of video game history can be told. Um, and uh, I see some, uh, some of our old merch in the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, our pandemic gift to ourselves was rebranding, so I'm sorry that your, uh, your merch is now out of date. Uh, please come by the museum and collect a free sticker for supporting us before the rebrand. Yeah, come get your free sticker. <laughs> okay, so normally we start with something like this. Why does preserving video game history matter? But We're at the Portland Retro Game Expo. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like we can skip this. Part. So, uh, a more important question, perhaps, is what does preserving video game history mean? Like, functionally, what does it mean to preserve video game history? That means preserving the games, right? It doesn't mean all of the games, <laughs> literally all of them. Do we have to have a collection like this full of walls and walls of games? We also have to be able to play them. Um, so that's a lot of hardware to maintain. Does this look like anyone's house right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, one room. <laughs> Just one room of the house, okay. Uh, we have to do arcade games too, so we need like a huge warehouse. Yeah, we have to preserve every game, right? So this is how we do it. Well, how about every digital game ever? Yeah, we have 300 iPhones full of games. No. Yeah, all of the, no, no, we haven't even got there. Oh, sorry, sorry. So that was a sneak. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, so. Long story short, we're not doing that. Um, and to be clear, that is preserving video game history. But like, yeah, that's not what, how we approach this. Um, and lots of people already are, thankfully. You know, I think most of you are probably familiar with the concept of emulators and know that uh, a lot of these games can be can be found online if you are looking for them. Um, so, I mean, this is just sort of a thought experiment we do at the beginning. Like, what do, what do you get out of making sure all of the games are playable? You get some very important things. It's an important part of it. We are ne never going to argue that. You get, um, you know, what it looked like, what it sounded like, how it plays. Um, if you're good at it, you can, you know, maybe play through the whole thing. Um, how it was packaged, if it was a retail, you know, physical release, the cover of the manual. If you are studying uh, the history of a game, this is all important data points, right? Yeah. Like that, but that's about as far as you can get with just the game. And is that enough, right? Like, uh, we, we like to think no. Uh, that doesn't really tell you who, it, who was playing it in its time, why they were playing it, who made it, right? What they were thinking when they made it. Uh, how, how was it sold to people? How was it marketed, you know? Um, like, what, what did Nintendo, th you know, think of Super Mario Brothers when they put it out? They obviously didn't know, they, they didn't know that they had the most gigantic game of all time on their hands, right? Like, but, but in order to contextualize a game, you need more than just the game. Yeah. That. <laughs> what what you I just said. said. Yeah. We need to understand <laughs> how they were made and how they were played. So this is sort of what we do at the foundation. Um, just to quickly kind of define some of these things, like what, is it, what does it look like to preserve how a game was made? This is things like source code, the actual things that kind of make up, you know, that you build into the actual game itself, the code that was written for it, the art assets that were made for it, the sort of like behind the scenes, like how this all fits together. Um, original art and documentation. You might have some cool things like um, email correspondence between people who are like, you should really change this uh, naked lady you put in level two for some reason. I don't think that's gonna fly. Uh, that was Super Mario Brothers. That yeah, was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, or even just, you know, things that sound really obvious, like this, this photograph here. Um, we we uh, provided that to a documentary. Um, that is a photograph of the team that made the first Grand Theft Auto. And that's just not a thing that exists in archives. And it's like, you know, because we're, we're so focused on the games. Like, okay, yeah, everyone has the first Grand Theft Auto. There's probably eight copies, you know, on the show floor right now. Probably more than eight. Um, but, you know, we don't have, we don't know what these people looked like or even like who worked on the game because it's not completely credited correctly or like what their roles were even. And, and so, you know, that, that's kind of what we focus on when we're trying to make sure that uh, material exists for people who want to tell the story of how these games were made and why they were made. 
And then the other part of it is um, we kind of shorthand it to how they were played, which is just you know how how does this game interact with the rest of the world? So that's you know discussion about the game and criticism. That's that's reviews about the game. You know when a magazine reviewed a game, um, you know a lot of them really didn't like Earthbound, and that had a some amount of effect on how that game maybe performed or how people thought about it later, right? Um, you know, videos and live streams of people playing the game, um, you know, Twitch plays Pokemon is one I like to point to a lot, it's just kind of like a big moment in a game that was already quite old and, you know, I don't know about, I don't think Pokemon is ever irrelevant, but like, that's certainly not a game that like everyone's talking about all the time, um, or should have been in 2014 or whatever that year was. Um, it's speculation and rumors about games, marketing, ads, press releases, promotions, um, just all the kinds of things that are like, how did this game exist and affect the rest of the world? So, the, you know, my what I always think about with this stuff, you know, we're trying to elevate the study of games to bare minimum where like films are, right? And and uh, what I often think about when we're when we're conceptualizing like well, what kind of stuff do we need what kind of stories do we want to make sure people can tell I think of the movie Citizen Kane Citizen Kane has anyone seen Citizen Kane in this room yeah good good a whole bunch wow, of great that's a lot. It's a pretty good movie right um, you watch that movie just on its own uh, and it's an entertaining movie it's a fun bit of theater you know the really good crew good cinematography is amazing etc etc it's, 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 it's a nice movie you put in disc two of that box set and, and it gives you the history of like what this movie was. It tells you who the real life person William Randolph Hearst was and what he was about, what a friggin' monster he was. And, and, <laughs> and like you start to understand like, oh my God, this movie was just like, it was a, it was a diss track, you know, against <laughs> William Randolph Hearst. And it just recontextualizes the whole thing and just makes that movie like easily three times the movie it was before you knew all of that. And we just think that games are actually in danger of losing the ability for people to be able to tell those stories when they're talking about these games. Right, because if all of you, if all you have is the game, like in this example, if all you have is the movie, you're just losing a lot of that stuff. So you, uh, you need access to the kinds of things we're describing in order to actually have the ability to tell those stories. And I mean, right now, and it's not their fault, but people are kind of bad video game historians. Um, these are some of my favorite examples. I'm sorry we uh, keep using you Did You Know Gaming. We yeah, love no, they're you. very good. This is a very old Did You Know Gaming thing. But um, yeah, the, uh, Gunpei Koi was not a janitor. He was a, he graduated with an electrical uh, mechanics degree and uh, he, was a, he was an engineer. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the Jeopardy one is the best one because that actually ran on, on Jeopardy. That is based off of a... Uh, like a joke Photoshop a, tweet? Yeah, yeah, a Photoshopped tweet and it made it onto Jeopardy. Um, yeah. Uh, the notion that an E.T. is like the worst video game ever, it's like it was not the... Yeah, the, the, exactly, Howard Scott Warshaw's yeah. book in front. Like, E.T. was not the worst game that well, month, I, even, right? Well, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's the latest slide. I forget, slide if, I forget if we at. have that in here. Uh, we might not, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah. It was not even the worst game to review that month. Uh, that award went to Gorf on the Atari 2600. So. <laughs> uh, there's a very popular video game history book that uh, has some things that are repeated pretty often as fact. Because, you know, and not, again, people do the best with what they have. When you don't have access to this actual information, you might put something in there that becomes passed down through generations and is not at all correct. Um, so, uh, you know, we, I think we need to rethink this notion, right? Like, yeah, it seems to, like that people maybe are bad video game historians. No, we don't see it that way. We just, we think the tools suck, frankly. Right. Like, all, there's... all this stuff that we just showed, like, where would you even go to find the real answers right now? Um, and I'm going to uh, start with something that should be really easy, which is video game magazines. Because have you guys heard of this concept of libraries? Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> there are these really cool places that keep publications, and you can, like, check them out and read them and stuff. They're um, free, support your library. Yeah, it's really cool, but um, they don't have video game publications. Um, this is a listing from, from WorldCat, and it's been a while since I've looked at this slide, so I'm hoping I can remember <laughs> why I have it here, but um, this is a really cool magazine, uh, Video Game and Computing Illustrated, or Video Gaming. Video Gaming and Computer Gaming Computer Illustrated. Computer Gaming Illustrated, thank you. This magazine, among other things, has an op-ed by Adam West about how video games are art. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is really interesting. Um, I have these, uh, you know, these locations here. You can see the distance here to the two yeah. libraries that have any copies of this magazine. In the entire country, there are two libraries that have copies of uh, what was a fairly popular magazine in the early 80s that has a lot of really interesting information about the state of uh, games in, the, in that time period. And this is, I'm in Seattle, so this is a distance from Seattle, but we're pretty close to here. Just drive to, just drive to uh, Michigan State. Yeah, just, yeah. just drive 1,800 miles to Michigan State if you want to look at it. Where they have two issues of the entire run. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not even consecutive. No, they are not consecutive. <laughs> hey, luckily, in the case of this one, these are on the internet archive. You can go read them for free. For now. <laughs> because uh, so is Replay, which is a really cool point up trade magazine. And uh, they're not anymore because... Because the, because the Internet Archive doesn't have, you know, the legal rights to digitally reproduce this magazine that is still in publication, that, that's, that is still sort of defending their copyrights. Yeah. So and they, you know, again, the Internet Archive, thank God, gets away with a lot, and we're all very thankful for that. But it is the point is it's not a solution, right? Like it's not it's not a fix all solution to just pop everything on the internet because the internet is, is not necessarily permanent. And and our, our best solution right now for video game magazines is one that you know, uh, this is not a slight against them. But we do the same thing. It's like they, they get a takedown notice from a copyright holder, they respect it, and poof, that magazine's not on the internet anymore. So not a great solution. Um, and just to kind of bring it full circle, here's where you can find replay magazines in the U.S. and it is also 2,000 miles away. So, uh, that's just the magazines. But what about all the other stuff we were just talking about? What about, um, you know, concept art and photos of the, of the people who made these games and that, and that sort of thing? This is, um, anyone familiar with the Starflight games? So this is the original raw material uh, generated, you know, the, the source code, the design notes, things like that. Like if you're studying Starflight, like this is, this is you know, your primary source is, is, is what was coming out of the creator's brain. Um, and that's then again, like we were just talking about magazines, like what about this stuff? You know, like libraries could not have collected this stuff. This is, this is something that just existed in someone's house that they you know, might not even know anyone is interested in. So that brings us to the Video Game History Foundation. What the heck are we doing about it? Because um, hopefully everyone in this room agrees that it's a problem that needs solving. So I heard I heard two yeses. Yeah. So that's good <laughs> enough. Yeah. So first and foremost, we're an archive of video game history. Um, we have a physical location in Emeryville, California. We finally have a full-time librarian. Last time, if any of you guys were here for our talk in 2019. Um, we have salaried positions. Now. Yeah, in, I mean, 20, them, <laughs> in 2019, we were all volunteer. I was full time volunteer, you were part time. It's been three years. We are now three full time people from nothing we've a role. Um, thank you. I heard one clap. <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exactly what we were talking about. We, we, we try to find the material that we know would be necessary to tell the correct stories of video game history, to, to bring them alive, to understand who made them, etc. So all of these are from kind of trips to go find and digitize and save this material. Um, two of these are in Chicago. What is that middle one? I don't remember that one. That is in Mark Flipman's basement. Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we fly to people who like produce games and we're like, what, what's in your basement? What do you got? Let's, let's dig it out, let's figure it out. and, and um, you know, but in a lot of cases, it gets uh, donated to us. We get it in the archive. Like in that specific situation, he's like, "Well, I want to keep that." And we're like, "Cool, we're gonna go to the library and scan it all and put them online." He's like, "Yeah, great." So here's some nice photos of the archive here, in case you just want to see it. We're very proud of it. We're very happy that we have this. We did not have this in 2019, so we're we're very happy. Uh, and hopefully, you guys will all enjoy the Bubsy Shrine. It's, it's, <laughs> oh, it's video game preservation. And that, that poster on the right is from Portland Retro oh, 2018. Is, yeah. I don't know if anyone went to our NES exhibit, but uh, we, we proudly display that in the office. This show's important to us. So we're saving what still exists. Like Frank said, we are accepting donations, which does happen sometimes you know, from developers, from people who used to work in magazines, um, from that sort of thing. Uh, we have cleaned out some offices mm -hmm. um, when they've shut down. Uh, we are reaching out, you know, trying to actively reach out to developers. Again, pretty small staff, so we I know we're we're not doing it all, but we sure are trying, and um, we're building an archive for it. 
and that's just us. Like we can't do it all. Like even even within the subset of what we do, you know, collecting development material and information, we cannot handle all of it. No one can. That's the so, next slide. It's the half of this slide. Sure. So you know, we're we're working with other institutions um, to to sort of make sure they understand uh, how to handle things that they might not be equipped for. I mean, this this top uh, bullet point is is maybe one of the most important to us, which is that. Um, at the foundation, we, we have uh, you know some game development background. I produced games for a while. I sort of understand the needs of how one handles you know video game source code and and just the notion of like oh no you need like a dev kit to deploy that code to et cetera et cetera. I won't bore you, but you know we're we're starting to sort of like come up with best practices for how other archives can handle material that is not part of the library science education system. It's for like game development. Um, and we're, uh, we're doing uh, academic research that we publish the results of, um, and uh, oh yeah, fighting the ESA, which is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can maybe talk more about that in Q&A, but just for a very, very quick version of it, uh, the Every three years in the United States, you can sort of advocate for further exemptions for libraries and archives to existing copyright laws because when they were written, there like wasn't this thing called the internet yet, and yeah. uh, we just we lived in a very different world back then. So, um, what does not make sense is requiring libraries and archives to give physical to lend out physical copies of things, especially when you have something like I don't know a game that only came out on the 3DS eShop. Yeah, so. there is no legal path right now for a library to provide access to a digital 3DS game unless they already bought it and it's on a system. That, that's and it. They lend out and, and that store's gone now. So <laughs> there is no, there's literally no legal path to providing those games ever. So uh, yeah, no one can actually do it all. We're trying to get everyone on board. Um, the industry needs to do a better job. Um, you know, academia has some things that they can learn too, and they're, they're helping a lot. Um, researchers, collectors, um, I mean, this show is, there's a lot of video game history that gets unearthed at this show. How many prototypes did you dump yesterday, Frank? Uh, like about 20. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need everyone to kind of preserve and, and celebrate our history. And, and I think that's a unique selling point of us, because Kelsey and I don't have, you know, a, a traditional, like, library or archives background. Uh, we, we collectively are like more like amateur historian, archivist, you know, game development and collector community, right? Like, like and, I, and I think that, I think that's unique in, the, in, in our world, right? Because uh, traditional libraries and archives, you know, that's kind of where they're coming from and they're trying to apply book rules to video games, whereas we're coming from video game world and trying to like force games into like bookshelves, basically. And now we have a like normal librarian from a real librarian. Yeah, we background. finally have so some. So we can background. kind of like <laughs> smush it all together and it works. We don't have to make stuff up anymore. We can just do it right. Um, yeah, I mentioned the, uh, I just thought you guys might want to see this. I don't know. This People is, like prototypes. <laughs> <laughs> this is something we did. This was one of the, uh, you know, we go on site uh, things. And this was um, someone who reviewed games in the 80s and 90s. and. Uh, like, hey, can we go dig through your basement? And he's like, sure, we found these. And he's like, oh, what, those? You know? <laughs> Let me find three unreleased games in there or something? Yeah. Was, yeah. So I mean, that's kind of a, a unique position we existed in the world is uh, that we have the availability to kind of seek this stuff out. And then, you know, a lot of times people don't want to do the work themselves. They don't want to like get a kit to dump this stuff, but they are like, sure, yeah, I don't, you know, don't take it from me, but if you just want to put it online, sure. Well, and you know, the thing is, um, this is another unique part of our story, I think, is that, um, yeah, there are, you know, video game preservation groups online. I mean, I, I, I consider myself a part of that world as well, right? Like people who will happily if given something like this, we'll digitize it, we'll preserve the code, we'll even put it online, et cetera. But no one has like funding to do that, you know? And 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 so in, in this particular case, you know, without funding, all you can do is is ask this uh, frankly fairly old man, right, to like go dig through his basement and find things and like, you know, trust it in the mail or like teach him how to digitize, you know? Like the, the point is that like we are able to use pledged, you know, donation funding to go make it happen. Um, and, and that's something that I, I'm really proud of. 
And also, I think coming from an industry background uh, makes some of those connections yeah. a little bit easier, too. Yeah, we, we know how to talk the language. <laughs> um, that's just a hidden palace, so that's where. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, do you want to talk about that? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, you know, a lot of, in a lot of cases, like, like with this stuff, um, we're, we can't be like this uh, industry facing friendly charity, but also like pirating ROMs. You know? <laughs> so, a lot of, in a lot of cases, we, we just sort of act as like, you know, the middleman. It's like, look, we'll go on site and digitize with everyone's permission, and, and we sort of contribute to like other projects. Like, hey, if you guys want to distribute this data, go for it. With permission from the donor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was another uh, big project we did. This was at Game Informer's offices. Uh, sometimes I still, yeah, forget how much work this was. Um, Do you see our robots that read a hundred discs at a time? It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, uh, Game Informer magazine, I assume most of you guys know what that is. They've been around since 1991, and yep. they have basically never moved offices, and they're kind of pack rats, because there's, there's space for that in, in Minneapolis, so they were just kind of throwing everything that they were sent from you know, the PR departments of all of these companies. If there's, a theme, the room. if there's a theme to all of this is that the Midwest will save us all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and this is another example of what I was just talking about too, right? Where it's like, Kelsey and I went and lived in Minneapolis for five weeks to do this. Like, we, like you know, we had enough funding that, and we had saved up and I didn't pay myself for three years. So we were able to, um, you know, and again, with the industry connection too, right? It's like industry connection and we have funding. So Game Informer Magazine reaches out and they're like, look, we have a lot of material. We're scared of, it's not really scared. It's like, we feel responsible for this. <laughs> you know, like, like we have, you know, game builds going back to the early 90s and press kits and things like that. And it's, it's, it's like, we don't quite know what we can do with it. We just know that we don't want to be responsible if something happens to this. Um, and so this is a situation where it's like, you know, we can't take that information and put it on the internet. Uh, they don't want to be rid of it. It's their collection. But that data needs to be saved because to their point, if there's a fire, you know, like if the magazine shuts down and there's just a lock on the door and GameStop corporate just like destroys everything that's in the closet because they don't know what it is, you know. Had to be saved no matter what. So we, we're in a position, thankfully, due to funding that that we can just go on site and like digitize things for over a month um, and just be like, look, we'll figure it out later. The data is safe, you know? Like we'll figure out the logistics of how people can access it. That's a future problem. We just want to run triage right now and make sure that things aren't dying. And um, thank God we did, because some of those disks were dead. I mean, like, like, like time claims us all. And, and, and CDR, you know, burnable CDs is not a permanent media, and, and some of those discs were, you know, delaminating, were dead. We, um, don't worry, it was like, you know, builds of like Madden 2001 or something. Like, 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 like it was, it was, it was not, we didn't lose anything there that, that broke my scary. heart. Yeah. But, but, uh, um, but it's happening, and, 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 and it's important that we do what we can while we can. You should also talk about this one. This I guess another, that is my face. Yeah, huh? that is your face. <laughs> so another thing we do is um, sort of try to tie together this notion of material and people uh, to get stories down while we can. Um, this is my favorite game of all time, The Secret of Monkey Island. Anyone familiar with Monkey Whoa. Island? Great. Um, so, you know, we talked earlier about source code without, yeah, that, that's just the raw, that, those are the files that are actually on everyone's computers when they're building the game. It's not what's on the disk, it's not what's shipped. And, and um, I was fortunate enough, I mean, I don't, I don't know, it's like life highlight, I don't know how to top this, but, you know, I was, we, we were given access to the source material for uh, The Secret of Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2. Um, the, you know, the actual files and stuff. Uh, we were given access to Ron Gilbert, that's the creator there, that his notebooks to kind of see what he was thinking, and we were given access to Ron himself, and we had this virtual event where um, I actually went through the source code and found, like, that room there is not in the final game, but it was in the source, and we rebuilt it, and we showed how it would have worked, and we were able to talk about how it worked, and. Um, what you're seeing in the upper left is I, I learned Ron's scripting language for, uh, it's called Scum, for his adventure games. And, you know, we were able to show in real time 
how people literally made this game. Like we, we scripted something new in real time and kind of showed how the tools worked and how you build it and how instantly it would be in the game. And we were able to show like their animation tools and, and how that worked and how artists were able to make it. And, and you know, the result was this uh, two hour-ish stream where, you know, people who've been fans of this game for 30 years learned a ton that they didn't really, they might have known like you know what I mean? Like, like they, they might have been able to conceptualize from interviews and stuff how these games were made, but because we had the actual stuff, we were able to actually show it in real time, and it helped you really understand not just how the games were made, but, but in this particular case, the soul of this game is how quickly one could script uh, like a, a joke in that game and like instantly see it on screen. And it, it help, kind of helped you understand like where the humor of that game came from. It was just people throwing jokes at the wall and letting them stick and, and, and it's and it's something that doesn't happen without that sort of unique position we're in, right? Where where we have this sort of industry and developer background and we're collecting material and, and so we tie it all together and, and educate. And you should go watch that if you have any interest in either kind of behind the scenes video game development or Secret of Monkey Island or both. Uh, it's on our website and YouTube. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's us, but we really do believe that everyone has a role in this. It really is an ecosystem that kind of requires everyone to be on board. Um, not just historians like us, um, not just like institutions and that sort of thing, but you know, the, the companies and the creators themselves, uh, the people who play the games and just want to learn more about them, and students and collectors are a big part of it too. So um, really everyone has kind of a role to contribute into the total mass of stuff that is required to truly preserve video game history. You know, and, and I want to pause on this for a minute, like, because we're at this show, right? Um, we think collectors play a big part in this ecosystem. You know, even just owning things privately is still a form of preservation. And um, I mean, we, we talked, we, we, we opened this panel by talking about how we don't collect video games. We just straight up don't at the foundation. And, you know, Oftentimes, collectors will talk to us and, and be like, look, I have this stuff, I'm not really sure what to do. And we're like, look, it, it, are you in danger of losing your mortgage? You know, no, you're good. Like, stuff feels safe right now. We, you know, we, we're, we're, not, we're not in a massive rush to make sure that, like, your stuff lives somewhere else. Like, but even beyond that, like, the collector world is, is like, trying to think of how to phrase this, the, the first line in actually documenting video game history, right? Like, we, we wouldn't have known about a lot of uh, uh, games and, and variations and, 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 and weird quirks and things like that if yeah, not I mean, for collectors box, and players. Right, yeah. box variants are part of the marketing story, you know, yep. part of the, uh, like, how a game was sold story. They, like, those are part of, and, and that's something that collectors pay attention to that uh, maybe a traditional historian or a, a library or something wouldn't. They'd just be like, okay, we have Super Mario. Uh, Super Mario Brothers. It's like, well, okay, there were like, there were like. <laughs> you have the matte sticker. Series, you have the glossy so, sticker. Yeah. You have the white oval. Which one do you have? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, let's talk. Uh, let's do some questions, and um, please feel free to you know reach out to us. And also, we run the museum here at this show, uh, the Pop Up Museum, which is just like around the corner. I kind of wish they put us in the other auditorium, so it was like right next door. Yeah. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna be there the rest of the day, so. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do some questions now, but if you don't get yours answered, uh, feel free to come punch us down. Let's line up at the mic because they're recording this, and I want to make sure they record the audio. Can I go over guys' question? Yeah. So I wanted to ask about, like in the news, there was some, like a month ago, there was a leak for like Grand Theft Auto 6, or who knows what that game will be called. Mm. What is the ethics behind like going and scouring the internet for any sort of like source code or screenshots for games that have gotten leaked by the industry that they don't want you to have? What do you guys do in those situations? <laughs> You're opening with a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is not the first time we will use the phrase uh, personal ethics this weekend <laughs> when I ask questions. Yeah. Um, you know, like institutionally, like what do we do? We ignore it. Like that—that's—that's that, that's too hot for us. Like there. 
there's a common sense line, right, where, it's, I don't know, someone sends a source code for a Mac game from the 90s that no one's selling anymore. It's like, and it, and it was stolen, right? It's like, okay, we'll, we'll take that. But, but you know, I, I think the answer for us is there's a line somewhere. It's definitely not on the side of an unreleased Grand Theft Auto game that they're about to sell, <laughs> or like the Nintendo Giga League, you know, that was, uh, 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 like a, a, a an online security breach recently, but well, and I'll, I'll say two additional things about this. One, it's important for us that we have some level of trust with the industry yep. because we want to open up this in a very like normalized and happy and legal way, where companies are just simply more comfortable sharing this stuff. And I think that kind of jeopardizes that entire conversation. Um, and number two, tons of people already downloaded it. Um, so if, if they do decide to, I mean they won't do this, but if they decided to just destroy the entire game and it was never going to be seen again, that would be a conversation for later. Some, lots, lots of people have those files and uh, that, that could be a, a later ethics question, but an immediate ethics question, you know, I mean we just, we, we have to, we have to be a little more, uh, I don't know, above the board <laughs> yeah. that kind of stuff. And I do want to, uh, that it makes an interesting point that didn't quite make it in here, which is another part of this. Um, you know, we're talking about the source code for Monkey Island. Source code for the industry is very, like, it's a trade secret. You know, they don't want you cloning their games. Um, part of this exercise was also slowly getting the industry to warm up to it not being scary for researchers to have access to material. So, I mean, that's Lucasfilm, that's the Star Wars people. And, and that's something where it's like, you know, we worked with them before we did the event to let them know what was happening. And the end result, I think, was very positive for them. And, and, and I think that that's a way that we can contribute toward game preservation in, in the way that we kind of uniquely can, which is getting people to sort of warm up to this future we want to see where, Lucasfilm's just straight up donating their archive to an archive. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, hi. Thanks so much for everything you guys do. I think uh, Thank you. you're doing some great work. Uh, my question is about uh, new media preservation and uh, rights management. Um, I worked for many years in new media. I was uh, writing for websites that no longer exist, uh, working on YouTube channels that no longer exist. It is often a, a huge challenge um, when working in forms of media that are uh, more recent and not as well uh, defined legally mm -hmm. um, to preserve some of this material. Um, my question to you is what avenues currently exist legally for uh, game preservation, especially as it's a more recent form of media than many of our copyright laws, uh, what avenues do you pursue currently, and if you could sort of uh, write laws or, or advocate or lobby for uh, changes in the future, what kind of things would you look to change? That's such a good segue into something we said we'd talk about later. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that I started this thing six years ago. Does that sound right? Sure. Sure. Six years of the VGHF. Why not? Yeah. Um, and 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 I think a lot of this past six years is sort of recognizing what our limits are. Like we can't do everything. And and something that, you know, maybe took me like two or three years was realizing that um, we can't solve the preservation of digital games uh, yet and, uh, on our own. Um, so that's part of the answer to your question. But the, the sort of like, what are the even theoretical avenues? Right, I, I think that's maybe the, the only way we can answer this because there's not really a clear path yet. Um, do you want to talk about the, the ESA thing? Yeah, I mean, a thing that we are, like a very good first step we are trying to take with this is, you know, I mentioned earlier that right now the way the library system works is, you know, you might have to, if you want a, a eShop 3DS game, as a library you have to have a copy, you know, a copy of that game already downloaded and on a 3DS that you maintain. And people and, have to come in and, and touch your 3DS. Physically yeah. check out and you have to like repair it and everything when it goes, you know, so that's just really unreasonable. So a, a very good first thing we are doing is advocating during this next round of DMCA hearings um, for 
uh, allowing libraries and archives to start distributing things digitally in the exact same way they already do with ebooks, with movies. Like, this is a thing that happens, yeah. it's just not there with games yet. And um, right now, we, are, we have a study that we are doing with the um, Software Preservation Network to kind of prove when this, these hearings go up. Um, how impossible it is to access most of these games in a in a legal setting. Um, I don't have the. Res I mean, we're still working on it. But yeah, we we're, we're doing a study, but we're, we're trying to show that like no, like all games are out of print. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, essentially, yeah. with with the um, thousands of games we are using as sort of our like sample study, which is um, every uh, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance game. Um, I think we did all PS two games maybe or something like that. I mean that. we don't and have then, full data yet, but well yeah, yeah, but then it's a and then it's a random sampling of like a thousand or two thousand other games. I can't remember the exact specifications of the study, but the point is it's you know a ton of a huge sample size of just older video games. Um, my guess is the answer is gonna be like you can still legally get like three percent of them. And obviously you can buy used copies of things, but like that's not what the ESA, who is the sort of the other side of this, the commercial advocate for it, is trying to say. They're trying to say that, you know, the money still goes to the IP holders, and that's just not the case for, I believe, about 97% of the games out there. So um, that is a good first step if we can get that exemption. That opens the door to further exemptions that can explore things like assets and source code and, and that sort of thing, but we kind of have to, um, we have to take the ESA down a peg. <laughs> so, because um, their position, when when uh, you know, I don't want to get into like the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the, the exemption rules and all that, but but um, essentially, they're every three years, like you said, we, institutions can apply for softening of the rules, and and the ESA's argument against. Uh, libraries being able to provide remote access to video games is that most video game companies keep their games in print. So we're trying to establish, first of all, that no, <laughs> are you crazy? Um, and, and then kind of go from there. Um, that And, and uh, to be clear, like there is already a bit of softening and then something like this was in the last round attempted. And the result is very weird, which is that um, Libraries can now legally uh, give remote access to software, but not games. If you're wondering what the difference between games and software are, Shrug. we are too. <laughs> <laughs> Is it if it's fun? Yeah, are you game has not fun? been legally defined in this context. But um, sorry, we don't have a clean answer to your question, but it's a really good question. Yeah, and we have a good start. And then, uh, just to quickly, the first part of your of your question was like, what what is the legal path right now? And it's like, you have to have permission from the IP holder completely, basically, in order to, to like fully share it. And there's also like, there's also a notion of things can be donated to the library by someone who's not the copyright holder and people can access it on site at that point. But that's, that is not sustainable and not the way that reality works when it comes to studying video game history. It's, on, it's done on the internet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope uh, Mario teaches typing is neither a game or a game. <laughs> We do have the source code for Mario Teaches Type Game. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I uh, love the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in this case that you're going around the basements and rummaging through all your stuff, yeah. which is super cool. Have Best been, part of the job is rummaging. <laughs> have there been any cases where people have said that they don't want to scan or preserve these things? And what are some of the reasons behind that? And what, how do you react to that situation? Um, personal information being yeah. really like I mean that and we we do that too like I'm um, you know some of this stuff that we've been going through there's like Mark Tremell's personal phone number on one of the documents and it's like I probably shouldn't yeah. let the whole world have his personal phone number that's probably not ethically correct there um, but I think the question was more about resistance too sure. right um, in in our experience well it's a tough one to answer. Like, like we'll go back to that Game Informer trip as an example. I'm not going to call it resistance, but it was like, look, we're a magazine that still publishes, and we work with the publishers that send us things. We can't like ruin relationships. So it's it's not resistance. Like we don't want anyone to get at it. It's more just like in that case, it's like 
let's slow down and figure this out over the years, right? Um, but um, save it first, right. and then let's talk about it and figure out how we can, you know, make it done safely. But in terms of like the the sort of basement rummaging aspect of, of, of it's 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 almost like in order to get to the point where someone invites you in their house, it's almost like they're they're already on board. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I think the resistance that we've found, um, and this is kind of interesting, is uh, in more than one case, someone's been like, "Yeah, come take it all," and then we come and take it all, and they're like, uh, uh, "I miss it." <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm gonna have it back. Um, so that, I mean, that that's probably the closest form of resistance from from sort of that community. Um, one level of resistance I'd like to sort of start dismantling more is is. Uh, um, the idea of uh, um, data from games existing on the internet diminishing the financial value in the collector's world. It's, it's sometimes kind of true, but usually not, and, and, and that's something that I'd like to sort of see less resistance of, but we're, we're getting there. That was a very thorough answer, thank you. Yeah. We ramble. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, as someone who's interested in getting into this field of game preservation and history, um, do you have any recommendations or suggestions on looking for those kinds of jobs or career paths? Oh, there aren't jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Did you miss the part where I said I didn't pay myself for three years? Because I didn't well, pay myself for okay, three years. Well, no, let me, let me, uh, let me uh, reframe that a little bit more. Um, there, there are starting to be, especially at like individual companies, there are very like kind of just yeah. now started to be archivist jobs there um like and two Pokemon. kinds yeah. right two kinds there's like sort of lore archivists right like like make sure that we we're not messing up the halo story yeah. is a job you know and then and then yeah and then archivists. there's like actual archivists so like the pokemon company just hired a full-time archivist um and i know a, a lot of the bigger studios like um ea and bungie and, and that sort of thing like they are starting to have an archivist my, my caution to you is basically just like, there's like probably 10 or 15 total jobs out there right now. Hopefully that gets way better. Um, people are starting to pay attention. Um, those are largely like capital A archivist work. So that's a like, you know, library science degree kind of thing. And a, um, my guess is probably like a, a, a real interest in the subject and a like show that you, uh, work, you know, like when you're doing your master's thesis or whatever, it's like, I worked on a video game thing in my, you know, it, for that. But yeah, I mean, right now, it's a really tiny field, and we kind of invented our jobs. Well, and... I would also say just in general, like, the, the sort of library and archive world, I, I think collecting uh, game-related material is just inevitable for most archives at this point, yeah, like, especially true. university archives, like, almost all of the major ones have some kind of video game archive at this point. Um, so, you know, if, if, if we're talking career path, that, that, you know, might be just kind of like target uh, universities that, that, uh, that deal in new media and things like that and, and start being the change you want to see from within. Um, I think would be the best answer to that. I do want to answer also from the perspective of not a career, just like how do I help? Um, and what we often tell people is just find your niche, you know, just 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 find your niche and, and go for it. Like whether that's games made in my town, you know what I mean? Like just 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 find that corner that no one's tackling yet and just do it. Because you can't just be like video game history, all of it, yeah. you know? It's like, like it's, saying book history, right. you know? It's just like there's, yeah. there's a lot of it. It's a lot easier to specialize and I think that's an easier way to um, I think it's the best way to be effective, too, right. is to kind of special. And it's how we all got our start. You know, I'm the unreleased NES games. You're the weird accessories person, you know? So like the, well, and, and, we, and we talk, too. So, I yeah. mean, if you become the, like, the Game Gear person or something, like, you bet someone's going to hit you up when the game, when something Game Gear that we don't know how to handle comes. That's Omar Corna. That one's I'm, done, okay, but not that one. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Maybe one or two more, unfortunately, unless it's lightning round. Let's find out. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, I'm a really big fan of your stuff. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, uh, are you worried about like the future of like preserving yes. like current video? <laughs> yeah. Kelsey's just worried in general I'm most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was just asking, like, 
I know you heard that like Google Stadia has like recently shut down and stuff, and like it, it, it's kind of worrying to see that like maybe sometime in the future like the companies are still pushing like cloud gaming and stuff, and I know that like it's going to be like a massive like nightmare in terms of preservation, and I was wondering about like your thoughts on that. Okay, I'm going to try to answer this the fastest I've ever answered this. Um, the short answer is yes, it's terrifying, it keeps me up at night. Um, answer number two, we know we can't save all of it, but the, the real answer actually is I like to try to um, kind of, I want people to rethink a little bit what we think of as game preservation. Yeah. We are absolutely going to lose some like builds of things, some, you know, the, the 14th day of the new Destiny update rather than the you know 20th yeah. day of the Destiny update. Like, we're absolutely losing some, a lot of that stuff. And um, I think the sooner we come to terms with some of that stuff, the sooner, sooner that we can have a plan of action that is still pretty effective, which is, um, you know, think about this from how someone 50 years from now is going to truly need to interact with this game and access it in the future. So if you plop someone in 50 years from now down in an empty World of Warcraft, like an empty Azeroth, yeah. are they really playing World of Warcraft? Probably they're, not. They're seeing a corpse of yeah. it, but they're not. They're not. There's no. Con, there's no. There's no contextualizing like what this game actually was. There's no knowing what the community was, etc. And. And what yes. is far more effective for a historian studying World of Warcraft 50 years from now is the Leroy Jenkins video. You know, like yeah. that's the kind of thing that people that is going to teach you like what World of Warcraft was and what a cultural effect it had on people and like how this game was played and how people were interacting with it. So I think the future of some of this stuff is going to be focusing more on making sure we are archiving things like playthroughs of things, commentary, live streams, um, you know, YouTube videos made about like an experience in the game or blog posts or something like that. Even just oral history, like tell me about your experience playing World of Warcraft, let's yeah. interview you as a, as, a, as a citizen of Azeroth, yeah. yeah. That's a great point, because like even like Blizzard's own like official method to like play the original World of Warcraft, like it doesn't like recreate it completely. Right. There's yep. still like stuff that they changed for like and it's also uh, just not the early 2000s again. Like, yeah. it's just, it's not going to yeah. feel exactly the same because, you know, you're not like 12 years old and it's after school and you're eating Cheetos and you're playing with your friends, you know? Like, that's. I, I think the short is version of this is uh, we just have to recognize that entropy is reality, that things will die, and we should uh, be running triage instead of uh, panicking about doing it perfect, you know? Um, we are a little bit over time, so we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Thank everyone, you. for coming. Thanks for the questions. And we, we are heading right back to the museum, which is the next haul over. I'm yeah. sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no, that's what I was going to say. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, feel free to follow us over there if you have more questions. I probably have to go to the bathroom first, but other than that. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And to the right are the playlist of the Portland Retro 2022 and some other interesting videos. Thank you.